Australia and the US sign a technology safeguards agreement, the culmination of a whole of government effort to secure an important path forward to expanding the Australian space industry. Plus, SmartSat SRC's internship winners are beaming in to discuss their summer plans in Italy and some interesting news about Mars. It's Wednesday, November 1, 2023. These are the science and space headlines you need to know now. Celebrating 20 years of Trekzone, this is Trekzone's Talk and Science. The highest levels of the Australian and the United States governments have formalised the Technology Safeguards Agreement, which paves the way for US space activities in Australia while protecting US technology and data while it's on our shores. The legal and technical framework has been a long time coming and will be the most comprehensive TSA of its kind for any nation. The agreement will enable US companies to not only utilise Australian spaceports for launch activities, but also return operations as well, like the Hayabusa 2 capsule return we saw in Woomera a couple of years ago. The whole of government effort is subject to one final hurdle in the domestic treaty making process, but from the Australian Space Agency to Australia's launch providers, this is good news all round. Equatorial Launch Australia's CFO, Russell Shaw, is beaming in. Russell, what does this mean for you guys there at ELA? Yeah, thanks very much, Matt. It's uh, it's certainly a good news story uh, from us and our point of view at, at ELA. Uh, we have lots of potential US customers who are very interested in launching in Australia and at the Arnhem Space Centre. So this is really a key milestone that makes it a lot easier to contract and um, facilitate those launches on an ongoing basis. The US is the biggest space market and you've been waiting for the ratification of this agreement, I understand, uh, for a while now. How fast can things move now? Well, certainly we are in the final throes of, of getting the uh, formalities uh, signed away by the Australian government. As you mentioned, this still has to go through the Australian Parliament, which I understand will take uh, a couple more months. So we expect that to be finalised by uh, early 2024. And really that paves the way for us to um, go out and, and contract uh, some in, some uh, potential US launch customers. Uh, Timing-wise, from a launch standpoint, we think that will facilitate launches as late as to that, as early as late 2024, but more likely in calendar year 2025. Uh, but there is a huge amount of planning that goes into these launches, and so uh, really getting this TSA away will allow us to have those more fulsome conversations with our prospective customers early in the new year. And even though there are those domestic issues to resolve, as you say, going through Parliament, it certainly really paves that way now and, and you can have more of a conversation with potential customers uh, uh, with a little bit more certainty, I guess. Certainly, the without or absent the TSA, it's quite difficult, um, particularly when it comes to the exchange of, of sensitive information around the launch vehicle. And some of those are key inputs that we need in determining the launch site and the uh, and, and the setup for their launch infrastructure. So the signing of the TSA really allows for that to move along and, and uh, we will fully respect all the safeguards that still have to be put in place uh, to make sure that um, we're complying with those um, technology uh, requ and IP requirements from the US government. Now, as you mentioned, there is that domestic hurdle, I mentioned it as well in the story, uh, that is still to come, uh, running it through parliament. Uh, does that mean further lobbying for you guys or is it kind of a, a done deal now that the federal government has signed off on it with the US? Look, we'd like to think it's, it's uh, it, it still needs to go through the the ratification process, but I, I think having uh, seen the, the Prime Minister and, and the US President signing that, uh, one would infer that it is uh, very, fairly well progressed and it, it really should be a formality. That said, we haven't seen the text of the uh, TSA yet until it gets tabled in Parliament, uh, but certainly things are looking good and the actual signing of that document uh, does mean we now have certainty as to uh, when that TSA should come into effect. Fantastic, Russell. Looking forward to the next, at least the next couple of years out of you guys as uh, this gets ratified and we can find out what it truly means for the Australian space industry. Thanks very much, Matt. From the Northern Territory to South Australia, we head now. Southern Launch's Amy Featherston is here. Amy, welcome back to Trek Zone. How excited are you all down there about this? We are pretty excited. The TSA is an absolute game changer for us. Um, as we all know, the US space industry has been leading the space race for generations, and this agreement is going to allow us to work closely with US companies to either facilitate their launches or returns to either of our two sites in South Australia. Very, Very exciting. 
Very Indeed, very exciting. A few days before the signing, in fact, Southern Launch inked a deal with Varda Space Industries to facilitate capture returns to Kniba, Varda being a US company. The TSA makes this cooperation all the more easier. Who is Varda and what are they planning on returning to Earth via the test range? Yeah, so again, very exciting. Varda Space Industries are um, pioneering the development of in-orbit manufacturing and space re-entry systems. So um, there's a lot of natural uh, advantages in the space environment that we all know about, in particular microgravity and, and the vacuum that enable the production of goods that can't be actually manufactured on Earth. So Varda are actually developing life-saving pharmaceuticals in space and they've designed this capsule so that they can return to Earth um, and then be harvested and, and manufactured into drugs that will, you know, help people around the world. Now, I haven't been to the Kuniba test range yet, but it is out there uh, next door to the Nullarbor, big open space. Uh, it was yep. a former defence site as well, so or it still is. Uh, it's a big area of uh, basically nothing uh, perfect for capsule returns. Yeah, so we've got about 22,000 square kilometres of space out there, and um, we've actually signed an MOU with another... Um, in space manufacturing company called Space Forge, and they're from Wales. So to put it in perspective, it's half the size of Wales that they can return into. Um, that, I think that kind of blows their mind in Europe. They're like, what? Actually, um, yes. Um, so, yeah, it's a lot of space out there. Not many people live out there. So um, And, of course, we work with the Australian Space Agency and other regulators to make sure every return from space is as safe as possible and, and we plan for every possible outcome. Absolutely. You know, we, we have a little bit of a, a laugh here about the size of it, but everything is meticulously planned and uh, very well taken care of uh, to avoid uh, any uh, potential issues. Uh, now, let's keep going with that TSA. This really is paving the way forward for our fledgling space industry to spread its wings and and fly, pardon the pun, in the years to come, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this opens the door for a multitude of opportunities for the space industry. So, you know, we've got some incredible satellite manufacturers and even component manufacturers developing um, technology right here in Australia. We, as the launch facilitator, are hoping we can launch a US rocket from our soil with proven rocket technology with Australian satellites on board. So, basically, we're making space more accessible um, for our Australian um, counterparts in the space industry. It's incredibly exciting. Beyond that, um, the capsule returns offer the opportunity for a circular space economy. So we're hoping that they return to Kniba, they're refurbished in Australia, and then launched again from our Whalers Way orbital launch complex. So there's an amazing opportunity for us to emerge as capsule refurbishment experts, um, but then also to use the goods that are manufactured in space and set up industries here that use those um, core, I mean, resources. I, I liken it to the mining boom of the future. There's a stat that says in 10 years we'll all be using something manufactured in space. So there's an incredible opportunity at our doorstep and I think we as a nation need to take this and, and run with it. Looking forward to everything that this TSA is going to bring uh, and the future there with Southern Launch and VADA as well. Amy, thanks for your time on this edition of Talking Science. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Matt. The SmartSat Cooperative Research Centre, Australia's leading space research centre, has announced that two of its PhD students have been selected to work on groundbreaking satellite research in a new internship program at the European Space Agency's PhiLab. Brandon Victor from La Trobe University and Namine Hendy from RMIT University will travel to Esrin, ESA's specialised centre of excellence for Earth observation in Italy at the start of next year for a three-month research internship funded by SmartSat. Phylab is a world-leading research centre with a mission to accelerate the future of Earth observation through transformational innovations and new technologies, including artificial intelligence and onboard processing. This research will create the next generation of predictive intelligence to forecast and monitor agricultural and environmental activities and disaster events from space with much greater accuracy. For more, Brandon and Namin are uh, beaming in. Guys, welcome to Talking Science. How exciting is this opportunity? Uh, this is a very exciting opportunity, uh, not least just because going overseas to European Space Agency, that by itself is very exciting. But we're also going to PhiLab in particular, who are, as you said, really world leaders in combining satellite images uh, with 
transform transformative technologies such as deep learning, which is where I'm supposed I'm mostly working deep learning and satellite images. Very cool. Namin, you're an electrical and electronic engineering PhD researcher at RMIT Uni. You've also got a PhD thesis to write. Can you tell us about it and how the internship is going to help? Uh, I'm working on a project uh, called Interference Modeling Detection and Mitigation for Improving Spaceborne uh, Space SAR Performance. Extremely excited. It was like a dream for me to go to ESA. Um, I hope to explore or, um, about the future challenges of technology during my time at ESA FI Lab. Um, I'm going to be um, working on very close to the uh, cutting edge technology of satellites. Uh, I can see the new challenges uh, on future satellite technology and space technology. Um, it's, it's a great opportunity to build my future and professional career. Very, very exciting. Brandon, you recently completed a computer science honours in deep learning at La Trobe Uni. Now with this internship, you'll be able to get a leg up on your PhD thesis. What's that called and how, what will three months at ESA enable you to do? So my thesis is called Using Satellite Images to Locate and Phenotype Plants from Space. Uh, or maybe a bit shorter is uh, trying to measure plant traits from space. Going to ESA is not necessarily going to directly improve my PhD in terms of a project related to what I'm doing, but it's definitely going to give me a different opportunity to try different techniques and learn from some of the best people to learn the combination of deep learning and satellite images from. Um, it's very exciting to go. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of the crucial steps as well, isn't it? I mean, that it's it's all about that networking and getting to know people uh, that can help you, uh, maybe not now, but certainly in the future as well. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a great uh, uh, connection opportunity. And I, I would like as well to uh, to thank uh, SmartSat CRC for funding uh, this research internship opportunity. It's... Um, uh, it's a great chance for me and Brandon as well to um, new um, uh, professional on sp uh, space technology um, in different discipline, maybe not in the same discipline of myself, uh, but yeah, it's a great connection uh, for my future and for uh, my professional developments, yeah. yeah. Well, congratulations to the both of you for this awesome opportunity. Good luck and uh, looking forward to seeing uh, the fruits of, of the labor. Thank you very much. Mars's metallic core may be 150 kilometres smaller than previously thought, according to international researchers across two papers who say they've found evidence for a fully molten silicate layer surrounding the metal core, which could be preventing the red planet from producing a magnetic field. The team used data from NASA's InSight lander, which was able to analyse the interior structure of Mars after a meteorite impact in 2021. They found that the metallic core is actually smaller and denser than previously thought and is insulated by the silicate layer. According to the team, this insulating layer prevents it from cooling and generating a thermal dynamo, which is what traditionally produces a magnetic field around planets like Earth. External sources such as large meteorite impacts or gravitational interactions with ancient satellites, which have since then disappeared, may have generated the magnetic field recorded in the Martian crust during the first 500 to 800 million years of its evolution, they say. The mummified remains of mice in the dry, windswept summits of Chilean and Argentinian volcanoes suggest mammals may be able to survive in Mars-like conditions, American researchers have theorised. These volcanoes have elevations of more than six kilometres above sea level and as such have very thin atmospheres and freezing temperatures, some of the most Mars-like conditions on Earth. The team says they found 13 mummified mice across the summits of multiple volcanoes, along with numerous other mice skeletons in areas that we thought were too tough for animals to survive. Radiocarbon dating showed that the mummified mice found on the summits of two volcanoes were a few decades old at most. Those from a third site were older, estimated at 350 years. 
Genetic analysis of the summit mummies demonstrated that they represent a species of leaf-eared mouse, which is known to occur at lower elevations in the region. The finding now raises important questions, including how mammals can live in a barren world of rock, ice and snow, where the temperatures are never above freezing, and there is roughly half the oxygen available than at sea level. It's not clear why the mice would have climbed to such heights. However, 500 years ago, Incas were known to conduct human and animal sacrifices on the summits of some peaks. However, the researchers note that the mummified mice from the volcano summits couldn't have been transported there by the Incas, given that none are old enough to have coexisted with them. In a paper published last week in Science, a global team led by Macquarie University's Dr Stuart Ryder and Swinburne University of Technology's Associate Professor Ryan Shannon report on their discovery of the most ancient and distant fast radio burst located to date, about 8 billion years old. It confirms that fast radio bursts can be used to measure the missing matter between galaxies. On the 10th of June 2022, CSIRO's ASCAP radio telescope was used to detect the FRB, created in a cosmic event that released in milliseconds the equivalent of our sun's total emission over 30 years. The source of the burst was shown to be a group of two or three galaxies that are merging, supporting current theories on the cause of fast radio bursts. The team also showed that 8 billion years is about as far back as we can expect to see and pinpoint FRBs with current telescopes. The discovery smashes the team's previous record by 50%. Well, we are podcasting on YouTube and across every podcast app. Find each of Trekzone's shows on Google or Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Tuned In and more. Plus, Trekzone's channel in the iTunes library gives you a one-stop shop for all of our goodness. So jump onto your favourite podcast app, find Trekzone and subscribe. On YouTube, membership continues to be available. Early access for less than a cup of coffee per month. And of course, our social media feeds always have the week's podcast highlights and Star Trek episodes. Getting back into the swing of things after a couple of weeks of Trekzone media work. This is our 20th year to the world as Trekzone.org. We are, of course, Trekzone. Going boldly since 2003.